Welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry and I have a healthy obsession with robots. Today I'm chatting with Aaron Augenblick, animator, director, producer, and founder of Brooklyn-based Augenblick Studios. Now, in our chat, Aaron is going to share how he jumped off MTV to found Augenblick Studios in 1999, and then how he produced, animated, and directed projects like Super Jail, The Americans, Teenage Euthanasia, and Swan Boy, which is airing on FX right now, so go check it out since we're chatting about it. So, without further ado, let's jump into the chat. Hi, Aaron. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Great. I'm great. We're both great. It's just a great day. Look at this. We're chatting. Yes. <laughs> so, Tell me, tell me a little bit about what's going on right now at your studio. You know, you, you uh, just finished opening up a brand new studio. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, this, the, my background is not a good indicator of how cool my new studio is. This is the, one of the few blank walls we have because uh, I'm in the conference room right now. But uh, we, uh, uh, my, my studio, Augenbook Studios in Brooklyn, has now been open for 22 years. Uh, which is extremely exciting. And um, this year during the pandemic, we, we you know, we're, we're mostly uh, virtual, uh, almost completely virtual. So we use that time to actually build ourselves a new studio, which is very exciting. So um, I think the last time we moved was maybe 15 years ago, uh, I think during Super Jail. And um, so it was a really exciting thing to be able to build a, a new studio from scratch, a really comfortable space to work, um, and, uh, you know, uh, get a, get like, you know, and, and get a, an exciting new, um, uh, start on the next chapter of Augenbook Studio, which is very exciting. For me. That's amazing. So wait, so you, when everybody was working from home, you're like, this is the perfect time to build a, a new studio. Yeah. And whenever yeah, for sure. we're going to, is this, is this because you're growing? Is this because you want the studio to be yeah, bigger? I or mean, is it just because you wanted to live a more lavish <laughs> studio life? It's it's a mansion that's only me, <laughs> and it's mostly bubble baths uh, and massage rooms. Hey, are you hiring? Uh, Can I work there? <laughs> no, uh, you know it was it was a couple of things. One, I, I've been dying to to build a new studio because we we've learned a lot with the way that we do things in the past um, fifteen years since we moved last, and honestly, the past twenty two years that we've been operating. So I have I've had a lot of ideas percolating about what my dream studio would be um, combined with um, what I think is going to be a major sea change in the industry, hmm. um, which I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, in well, depth tell me about that. Cause like, yeah. Yeah. So like the old way your studio, what was the culture slash space like versus like, yeah. why did you rebuild and where's the future going? Well, I mean, the, one, of the, one of the exciting things about my studio um, that I think is a little different than most studios is that we have done the majority, at least 95% of our productions in-house uh, for the two decades that we've been in operation. So uh, what that means is our studio just keeps getting bigger and um, while still being what I consider a boutique studio, because we only work on the kinds of projects we want to work on and the projects that I feel uh, drawn to creatively. And um, so what, what had happened was we got to a point where we had this studio that um, everyone had to work in the same room together uh, and everyone had to be roughly in the vicinity of Brooklyn. Um, now, when everybody went into quarantine, obviously that changed drastically because our entire staff became virtual. And what ended up happening was we actually became busier than we've ever been while in quarantine. We ended up doing uh, three series simultaneously in, in addition to a number of uh, uh, needy commercial projects. And um, we, were, we just had, a, had a, a need for a, a large talented staff. So we opened up globally in a way that we, we really hadn't before. Um, we had, you know, over 150 people working on Teenage Youth in Asia. We had, you know, dozens and dozens of people working on other projects. And, you know, we had things working around the globe. We had some really talented people working in England. We had a lot of talented people working in Brazil. Uh, we had just a lot of really talented people around the globe. And it was such an exciting thing. I mean, since my studio has been open for two decades, um, you know, I'm happy that we're not, you know, a lot of people, the older they get, the more conservative they get, they sort of fall into their, their, you know, routines. And then this, this year just busted everything open. And we were doing these exciting new shows and we're all these new people and do, developing a lot more projects than we ever have. And a few of the shows that we're in production on now are projects that we developed internally. So it just became a very exciting time. So 
uh, as far as the space goes itself, we I wanted to build a space where people can come and work in person if they want to, but that they could actually work from home. And we have the infrastructure for that as well. And that we can have a very, very large uh, virtual staff working on all these different productions all being managed by um, the people here at the headquarters. So that was part of the thinking of why we built a new studio was to build a studio that's going to operate for the future, which I truly believe, and we'll see, this is a recording a decade from now, uh, future historians or maybe robots that have taken over the planet can listen to this and say, boy, he made the totally wrong call. He was totally wrong. But I think I'm right. I only could use my own uh, instincts for whatever I do. I think that the hybrid model is the uh, way of the industry, is the future of the industry. I can't imagine an animation studio that is not going to be having people working in-house and a lot of people working uh, from home as well. I, I will I will be very surprised if that does not become industry standard because, well, it, uh, you know, when all of this happened, when the shutdown happened, you know, there was the very, very beginning and they're like, oh, what's going to happen? The whole industry is going to collapse. There's no, there's not going to be anything to watch, right? If there's one thing we do well is we like to sit and watch things. <laughs> we like to watch shows and movies and all these different things. And, you know, the need was there. So all the animation studios, all, all, all of my colleagues and, you know, Titmouse and Bento, Bento Box and Hornet, like they all just kept making animation. And we just had to adapt to this new uh, process of having a lot of people working virtually. And I think everyone's doing a great job. So, okay, so give me a snapshot of what the new studio looks like, because in my mind, I'm picturing it as like smaller and modular, like if people want to mm, come versus exactly. expecting a lot of people to know. Very not true. It's actually a, a, it's a slightly smaller space than our last space, but with more room for everyone that's here. And, and like you said, very modular. So there's different mm. parts of the studio to spend your time in. You can work over here. You can work over there. If you have a Zoom meeting, you can do it from the conference room. You can do it from the, you know, from the kitchen. You can do it from all kinds of different places. So hopefully it's a, it's a comfortable place for all the core staff members to work from. And we also have edit suites and uh, all kinds of different uh, fun bells and whistles as well. Nice. Well, that's really exciting. So tell me about some of the projects. You know, you said you were busier than ever. And I know that, you know, you just had two projects launched. You had uh, yeah. Team of People and Swan Boy. Tell me how you picked those up originally, because you also mentioned you only take projects you want. And yeah. like looking at your roster of, of um, work over the years, you know, you have a very distinct and specific type of 2D that you take on, like Super Jail, which is like very like flat all the way up to even like your recent stuff, which is kind of flat, not, mm. not a, I, I don't mean to say that in a bad way, but just the style. Is you it, are a stop motion person, so everything must <laughs> everything look flat. very flat to you. <laughs> why is it so flat? Yeah, why is 2D flat? Yeah, why is 2D the proper so term flat? is actually 2D. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but tell me how you picked up these projects. Like, are people coming? Is Adult Swim saying, like, look, we've worked with you for a while. We want you to take on this show. Yeah. Um, or are you saying, like, hey, you know, uh, you, you, you hear about this show, you're pitching and bidding on it. Right. Like Both happen. Um, I would say the majority of the work that we do at the studio are projects um, that people come to us with, um, usually at, you know, at, at the beginning stages where we get to envision uh, how everything's going to look, how it's going to move. Uh, what's the tone of the show is always really important to figure out early on. Uh, I'd say that's the majority of what we've done from the whole history of the studio, but we also have a very healthy IP um, department where we create a lot of original shows. Um, one of the things uh, I'm very excited about that we did um, in the past year is I've been uh, developing some kids material. Um, I haven't done, we've done mainly adult shows. Um, and one of the things, you know, I, obviously the majority of my inspirations were all things I watched as a kid from, you know, cartoons on Sesame Street uh, to Looney Tunes to Disney to, you know, all the usual suspects were, were my biggest inspirations as a kid. Um, also a little G.I. Joe and Smurfs and that stuff too. But um, uh, I, so I, I love animation. I love kids animation. And it's something I haven't gotten to do enough of. And um, so we started a, a, a sister studio called Future Brain Media um, that focuses all on uh, kids programming. And there's a show that I created that I don't know if I can even say the name of yet, uh, but I've been Ooh. working with PBS on a brand new series that was something that I created that I am so excited about and uh, will be uh, hopefully talking more about in the, in the very near future. Um, so that's something we've been working on that I've been excited about. Um, Teenage Euthanasia was a project 
with PFR, um, and that uh, is it was created by Allison Levy and uh, Alyssa Nutting. And Allison, I know from Wonder Showsen. We did a show called Wonder Showsen together uh, that that she created uh, with John Lee and Vernon Chapman. Uh, for MTV, and we were the ones that did all the animation. If, if you're not familiar, it's uh, like Sesame Street on acid, and uh, it's a lot like Sesame Street. There were puppets and clips and variety show, and we did all the animation and the graphics for it. So I knew them from all the way back then. We've always stayed in touch. Uh, I love everything they do. Uh, Xavier Renegade Angel to Shivering Truth. I just love everything they do. I think they're geniuses. And Allison created this show, and came to us pre-pandemic. We created the pilot uh, over, you know, almost two years ago um, for Adult Swim. And again, developed it, you know, the visual style, the tone, uh, worked really closely with Allison for that. And uh, we were, we did the pilot pre-pandemic and we went into production shortly after the quarantine. So did you, sorry, you've, you're giving me like so much. I don't even know what yeah. to ask you. Or Stop to start. me anytime. I'll blather on forever. <laughs> Stop. Okay. So well, I have a few questions. Um, one of them you is like, a buzzer. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. Please. Shut up. Please. Yeah. <laughs> um, Please. Did, you, did you create the pilot before you pitched it for, for Teenage Youth in Asia? Like were you that He had already you? had, I think the concept picked up for pilot Gotcha. From Adult Swim. Because um, like, what what was the selling? Because, you know, people are pitching Adult Swim all the time, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Like, what was the selling feature of this show? I think when she, like, yeah, she we sold this. it. Well, I mean, you know, they, they have a really close relationship. I mean, they've done at least three or four Adult Swim shows. So like, we'll take I anything you more. make. <laughs> kind of. They have a very, I mean, they they have a great track record. And they, they make some of the smartest, weirdest, funniest uh, uh, shows. And um, so... Uh, they, uh, I think it was picked up uh, on the concept. And I think early on, uh, Abby Jane, who's the art director, uh, yeah. they had actually uh, met Abby before we even got involved. And she had done a lot of sketches of the style and what the characters would look like. So I think it was picked up at that level. Okay. And then when it came to us, it was more about, okay, we have this rough idea of the way it's going to look and what the characters look like, you know, what, what does the show look like and feel like? And, and that, you, there's just you, so much in that. Can you give like a one sentence of what the show is for people who might not have uh, heard of it before? <laughs> um, uh, so Teenage Youth in Asia centers around a funeral home. Uh, and it's about uh, a, a mother and daughter. Trophy is the mom and Annie is the daughter. And Annie's uh, name is short for euthanasia. Her, her mother named her euthanasia because uh, she was so annoyed by, by having her. And it's essentially about a mother and daughter. So the mother uh, was a wayward, wild child and uh, was a very uh, a, a deadbeat mom and ended up uh, dying uh and her body was shipped back to the funeral home back to her daughter who lived there and through a freak occurrence uh of the daughter's tear coming from her eye and hitting the corpse and lightning striking and then embalming fluid uh all uh, connecting at the same time she came back to life so now she has a second lease on life she is a living dead person that has beetles that live inside of her body uh, and she has death powers. But really what she's concentrating on is she really wants to mend her broken relationship with her daughter. So, so it's a and I, I may be the age. worst person to pitch this show. Allison and Alyssa would do a much better job. But uh, so that's basically what it's about. They also is uh, they live with their her mother, uh, Baba. Uh, who, who's Annie's grandmother, and also Uncle Pete lives there as well, who's Trophy's brother, uh, who has a lot of uh, uh, Oedipal issues. Um, it's a very dark comedy. It's also uh, post-apocalyptic. It takes place in a post-apocalyptic Florida. Um, and so Florida is a big character in the show as well. But, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, madness and, and weirdness and surrealness and fantasy but I think it, essentially it really is a, a story about a mother and daughter and, and, and their close family and trying to, um, you know, uh, you know, be, be a family and, and, you know, and, and be close together while the whole world is sort of trying to tear them apart. Sounds horrifically cute. And also, <laughs> uh, I think you did a good job of making it sound. I try, I try. It's very complicated. Like adult I humor mean, and stuff in the show. But okay, I'll so you that, mentioned... 
You mentioned a little yeah. while ago that you have 150 people working on this show. Is that, yeah. is that, that seems like a lot to me. Is that normal for this type of show? That's including, you know, everybody that's producers, Just everybody. artists, <laughs> you know, music, uh, But like how designers. many actors are you having uh, animate the show, for instance? Like uh, animators? Oh God, the exact numbers. I should know that. I mean, it's at least 25, uh, okay. probably a lot more, probably like 30 or 35 animators. So, so is this typical of lead animators? Yeah. Is this typical of like you know your your classic? We produce this show equals about 150 people each time. Um, this was a lot. It was pretty fast, and it was a brand new show. So we ended up having to bring a lot more people as as the year hmm. went on. Um, also, was doing it in quarantine, and, and we found quotas tend to be a little lower hmm. in quarantine when people working from home. So it, it we definitely bolstered the team as the year went on to make sure we got the show done on time, and it looked amazing. Um, but things fluctuate. You know, the type of the, you know you have to treat every um, production. You know for what's what's best for the style of the show the style of the humor and this is a complicated show there's a lot of characters there's a lot of locations there's a lot of storylines it's one of the more complicated shows that we've ever uh produced um so this one took it definitely took a lot of people but you know another thing i have to point out is like this was an in-house production and, and i know that sounds strange because i just talked about the fact that we did it virtually but this isn't this isn't a show that was shipped overseas to any other company um this was done completely um here um largely in in new york um and that's rare as well but so it definitely it takes a lot of people to make a show like this amazing is that what you just said is that part of the criteria of how you pick your projects like what, what makes you pick a project and say no to another project i guess um I mean, it has to, number one, it has to be a show that I'm interested in, a type of show that I would watch, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, I, I it, and it needs to be something that seems exciting to me and new. Um, I don't want to just do the same thing over and over again. It's funny because you said, you're like, oh, your, your studio has such a style, but the two, the do criticisms I get about my studio haven't been open for two decades is I, I've had some people say, how come all of your shows look the same? And I've had other people say, how come your studio doesn't have its own style? Do you know what I mean? I've, I've heard both, you know what I mean? Okay, because it's true that like, you know, you, you're right. The one, you know, through line is that we like 2D cartoons. I like hand-drawn cartoons. Uh, I love the history of animation. So obviously I'm very influenced by, you know, everything from, uh, you know, Fleischer to Disney to Windsor McKay to Ub Iwerks to, uh, you know, Bakshi. You know, I love all that stuff. Uh, print Parn, foreign animation, you know, but I'm also, you know, heavily influenced by underground comics and, you know, and things like Chris Ware and Robert Crumb, and, you know, and, and Daniel Klaus and Art Spiegelman, like I love all that stuff. So there's all, there's all of these, these influences that come that influence the type of work we do. But I like to think that, you know, every show we treat differently, you know, and then like, as much as we have a through line of doing 2D animation, um, that's influenced by comics and animation. Uh, you know, there's there's a different look to, like you said, you mentioned Super Jail. Super Jail was meant to look like, uh, you know, a 13 year old boy was sketching in his, in the margins of his textbook and making everyone in his class, you know, you know, getting ground up in a meat grinder. You know what I mean? So like, you know, there was like that kind of look. And then there's things like we just finished um, another project that we did during the quarantine was uh, we did the animation for Headspace uh, for Netflix, uh, where all of our influences were, you know, fine art, things like Magritte and Matisse uh, and surrealists and abstract painters. And we wanted to have this very um, meditative, painterly, abstract look that moved very slowly and, and very hallucinogenic. And uh, that was meant to, to uh, be uh, uh, conducive to meditating, right? And to calming down, right? You I don't want meat grinder style for You couldn't to pick two more different shows from yeah. Super Jail where people are stabbing each other in the face and then Headspace where you were meant to watch it and fall asleep or meditate or feel better. Um, two very, very different shows. Both, both hand drawn, both you know, two D animation, um, and and there's a, there's a large spectrum of work that we do. You know, we just finished Death Hacks, which was meant to evoke uh, you know Looney Tunes meets uh, EC Comics, and you know, and and uh, you know, uh, Ugly Americans was was our delving into like 
you know, horror movies. And there's just a lot of different things. And the jellies, you know, had this, you know, very, uh, very, very surrealistic cartoon musical look. So there's a lot of different things that we do. And all of these are things that I'm interested in. So for every time we do something, it's always like, what's, what's, you know, what's something that we could do here that could be exciting and a little bit new. Fair enough. I guess I have to take my comment back then. <laughs> but okay. So when you say like, <laughs> when we, when you say Augenblick Studios picks, are you talking about Mr. Aaron himself chooses which shows uh, do, I, you, a, do or do I, not work I, on? Largely, but um I, you know, largely, but I also have, you know, a core team here of like, like my best people, my favorite people, like creative directors and yeah. all together, like, you know, we all have a say on, on, you so know, what we're working so on. So tell me about, you know, doing. running a studio for the last 20 years. Like wh what is your role? Cause I know that you do animation yeah. and you also do the business side and you do podcasts once in a, once in a while. <laughs> I do. I do. Um, uh, I, I will say, I think in the early days, I, I, you know, you could definitely chart like, you know, the, the, so there's probably like a, a, a line, uh, you know, that, that rises, you know, uh, I, hopefully of our success, both creatively and financially over the past 20 years. And then the same, the, the mirrored line that goes down would be my actual drawing. <laughs> Yeah. So the more we, the more we do, the more success we have, the less I draw. So I don't know what that means about my talent, but um, you know, I, 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 I still draw a little bit, mainly like sketching for people and, you know, inspirational and, you know, things like that. But uh, there was a point when I would like design whole shows and, you know, do animation on shows and that and in the early days, I'd say the first decade was a lot of that was a lot of, you know, protecting me drawing on the shows that we were doing, mm. but there gets to be a point where, you know, creatively, for one thing, there, there's, there, there's two things the one. I think, you know, to be realistic and humble, I think is important. And like the more, if you, the more I go and in through the, you know, through my career, I'm like, wow, there's so, there's so many people that do things way better than me. <laughs> you know, it's like, like I meet these talented people. I'm like, wow, you're way better designer than I am or way better animator than I am. So I meet a lot of really talented people that I want to work with. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, creatively driving shows which is what i love to do i love to creatively drive shows that's why i tend to these days like you never know what title to give myself on shows but now i, I call myself a creative producer um which i think describes what i do which is you know i want to help make these shows happen i want them to be i want to creatively develop them make sure they look feel uh and and you know are as funny as they can be, right? And you, it's tough to do that. I mean, animation is so labor intensive that it's tough to do that when you're sitting and animating all day. So um, I tend to draw a very little bit, but I tend to develop and manage and work with people and collaborate with people a lot. That's the, mo the majority of what I do. Nice. So take me back to 23 years ago, Aaron, like what was the driving force behind starting your own studio? And like, you know, what what has made it a success over the years? Because, you know, being an animator and being really right. skillful at animation is one thing, but there's a whole like business side that you also possess. So like, what was the drive to start yeah. what you're doing now? Uh, the, it's, 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 it's hard to even, you know, remember what I was thinking when I started my studio. I, you know, I think it was a combination of um, uh, ambition and stupidity, right? It was like, I was very ambitious. And I had no idea how hard it was going to be, right? So um, initially, I mean, I did have, and I always have had, uh, I, I think, um, honest um, um, impulses uh, and motivations for what I do, which is that I I'm an animator. I'm an artist. I love art. Um, that's always my focus. It's always the creative drive of the studio is going to be um, the artwork itself. Um, and I didn't start a business, you know, as a business, I started it as a way to make art and, um, and, and, that, and that's remained consistent and, you know, and look, I'm also, uh, you know, a, a, a strong businessman as well, because I, you know, I, I do try to make sure and protect my staff and to be able to continue doing the work that we do, you have to have business sense as well. So, yeah. um, I'm not well, going to lie what there. The, what was the tipping point from you working as like a full-time animator to, yeah. to then, you know, quitting your job and doing things on your own? So I, I got, you know, I went to school of visual arts, um, in the late nineties. Uh, and that's where I learned animation. Um, I did a thesis film, uh, that got into a lot of festivals and was seen by MTV. 
Uh, and MTV offered me my first job uh, where I worked on uh, a few different shows, including Daria. Um, I worked on Downtown. I worked on a few um, late 90s MTV shows. Uh, and I worked at MTV for a couple of years, um, enjoyed it, uh, met a lot of uh, really amazing people that I've remained friends with to this day. Uh, that's where I met Chris Bernowski, who runs Titmouse. Uh, that's where I met Christy Caracas, uh, who created Super Jail, Tunde Adebimpe, who I still work with on the musical side uh, from TV on the radio, I met at MTV. Um, and I also just learned all about the way that studios make animation. And uh, I was purposefully annoying to everyone there in that I made them move me around from job to job because I just was very curious. And I've always been very interested in how animation is made. So. You know, as soon as I would get good at one thing, like I started off, I mean, I started just being a PA and then I was like, oh, I really want to try doing layout and then I'm doing layout. I want to try doing design and they move to design. I want to try animating. I want to do animating. And then by the end uh, of my run there, I, I was directing episodes of Daria, which was like a really big deal and for me. And at that point, I felt like, okay, like I understand roughly how animation gets made at every stage of the process. Um, and I don't want to work directly for a large corporation forever. Um, I, I didn't love working directly at the Viacom building. Um, and I've always been sort of, you know, had, 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 you know, an indie spirit and, um, was like, okay, I, I have a good idea on how to make animation. And, you know, I, I, I have a lot of ideas for cartoons I want to make. So I started my studio and I didn't have any investors. I didn't have a lot of money. I had whatever money I'd saved working at MTV for a couple of years. And um, I opened it in Brooklyn. And this was in 1999 when no one was opening a business in, in an animation. So what do you mean? You like started renting a studio space and you bought equipment? And you I basically, you were I mean, we, 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 a... we, we didn't even have that many, like we had one computer we had a small little room. I think it was like 300 square feet. Uh, had a couple of tables that we built by hand that pe people could draw on. Uh, had a bunch of pencils and paper. And you're and like, now, now animate. <laughs> yeah, now we're an animation studio. So, so how did you get your first client? Um, there was, I think, technically our first client uh, was... Yvette Kaplan, who I had met at MTV, and Yvette's amazing. She directed the Beavis and Butthead movie, and she uh, was doing some work with, I think, a show called Between the Lions, and we had met, and she she kind of gave us our first job. She was like, hey, you know, I, I like what you do, and, you know, he, I wanted to see what, she, what you do with this project, and, you know, we took on a lot of, like, little tiny projects and little jobs, and honestly, it was the infancy of the internet, so we were doing, like, every crappy internet job you could do from like e-cards to you know weird web banners and like all kinds of stuff like whatever was going on in the early 2000s you know with internet art um you know and whatever they would have called looping gifts at the time i don't remember but you know looping animations and doing all kinds of things and uh we just did every we took every job we could possibly get but for every job we did we did everything we could to make it great Right. We didn't do any, we didn't phone anything in. We took, we treated every job, no matter how terrible and embarrassing it was, like it was like a feature film. And uh, there's, our stuff started getting uh, seen. And the other thing that we did was we were always producing independent projects on the side, uh, short films, uh, pitches, uh, comics. We were always just creating art. Yeah. And then what would happen would, so we would work during the day on some, you know, e-card. And then at night we would work on like an independent film and the, the two, you know, cross pollinated. So we would learn things on jobs that we would start doing in our independent films. And we would do try out new styles and experiments with our independent films that would feed our uh, you know, work for higher projects. So we became sort of a creative force pretty quickly, being as small as we were and homegrown. And when you, you know, say it all sort of talking like five, five people, two people. Uh, between yeah, I think the early stages were like three to five people. Yeah, there was a couple like like-minded people that came out from MTV with oh, me. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, and you know they would sort of come and go based on we would run out of money and they would go. I have to go back to a real job. <laughs> um, so a lot of people came and went uh, in the early days, and then so that was how how, how it was for the first couple of years. We were just constantly 
almost bankrupt. You know, it was just, it was constantly just doing some work. You know, I mean, talk about paycheck to paycheck. It was just like at any minute we were going to close. But like at the time I didn't care because it was like, uh, you know, I mean, I did care. I mean, I was, I was ner a nervous wreck all the time, but it was like, it wasn't, it did, I didn't have the pressure, honestly, that I would have later in life because once people start depending upon yeah. your company as their livelihood, as their sole, you know, job, there's a different level of pressure there. Now I have, you know, I have a duty to my employees to sustain, you know, uh, a certain level of safety with the company we had at the time I was 22 and it was just like, let's go crazy. And we get drunk at night and we draw all day and see if we can make good cartoons. And if we don't exist tomorrow, okay, I'll try something else. So the first few years, which is very chaotic and very creative and very exciting. Um, but we learned, we learned how to make animation and I learned how to run a company the hard way. Cause I didn't know anything I was doing. Like I didn't know how to, you know, I didn't know anything about accounting or payroll or, you know, how, you know, how any of that, you know, work got done, but you know, you learn, you learn, you know, if was you, there, if you want to, you can learn. Was there a tipping point for the business itself where things started to get more stable and you're like, now, now I feel good. Now we can like grow now, you know, like now this is serious. Like, I'm hoping in the 23rd year, that's, that's what's going to happen. No. Uh, <laughs> you go home, you're like stressing. This is the, your next head. year's the year. No, um, I look, I, I, it's definitely calmed down over time, but you know, you can never, you know, uh, be um, too complacent. You know, it's like, I always, as soon as you get like, okay at doing something, you know, you got to keep things alive and try doing new things. You yeah, know what I mean? Like I've happens. seen, I, exactly. No, it, that's a good point. Like, it's like, you know, a lot of studios went under at the beginning of the pandemic because they weren't willing to adapt to a virtual uh, infrastructure. And for me, it was, it was a no brainer. And for luckily my staff, they're, they're all, you know, they're all scrappy and they were, they were all really willing, like really quickly. I think in one week we went from everybody working in, in a room together to everybody working uh, from their homes, you know, and um, you know, that willingness to stay, keep things alive, keep things exciting, try new things. Um, you know, I, I think keeps, keeps a company actually will make a company, uh, have more sustainability than being overly conservative with everything that you do yeah. and just trying to replicate the same successes you've had in the past. Gotcha. So you, you've been eating, breathing, sleeping even more than that animation for most of your life. Like, tell me yeah. how that is. What are your thoughts on it? Maybe like, you know, thinking about animation and doing animation every single day. Like, do you have any, do you have any superior, I don't know, thoughts on <laughs> superior thoughts, superior on, thoughts animation. on like, you know, just, animation in general or like how to accomplish things or animation theory or whatever yeah i mean i look i, I love animation I, I obviously uh you know i i love uh i, I love hand-drawn animation and i'm so excited to see because it's like having a studio that focuses on 2d animation you know every few years people go Oh, when are you going to stop drawing? You know what I mean? Like, it's just has always been like from the day we open, it's like, oh, I hear they don't draw animation anymore. I hear they do it in computers now, you know, like from my own family to people in the industry to They're network like, when execs. When are you going to be unemployed by this? Everyone, <laughs> everyone always, and, and you do stop motion. I'm assuming you must have the same experience, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many times do people go like, oh, do you have to make this stuff? Yeah, like, can't, can't you just put it in a computer? <laughs> don't they, you know, they have computers that make these things now. I'm like, you listen, know? I still want to work <laughs> i mean honestly what do you what do you say when people say that to you about stop motion i'm curious um i just it depends on who it is because you know if it's my yeah. uber driver driving me home from the <laughs> studio i'm like oh yeah because i was explaining like stop motion he's like oh my daughter loves frozen and i was like right not the same thing so no, no but different thing. um for me like for me that's a big question you know like uh, a big thing that i've been tackling is why stop motion if if computers can do it yeah mimic textures why even bother doing it in stop motion? And a big thing yeah. for me is like the story has to um, specifically be for stop motion. I want the audience to know this is real, that they can like reach out and touch it. You know, there's certain right. textures that you can't really uh, replicate. But if the story is just like, you know, could be animated 2D, 3D or something else or live action, then I don't think it should be stop motion. What, what, what in the story do you think uh, is specific to stop motion over CGI? Um, when I, I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to give an example, but some, like when you want to 
tell the audience that this is a real thing. Like for instance, like I just mm. animated an Ultra City Smiths and mm. part of the show, the shtick is that you're, we're animating these like dolls. Right. Like they're like puppet like dolls. And right. if, if it was CG, you know, the audience watching it, part of like the humor and like the weirdness of the show comes mm. through. These are just dolls essentially that are being animated. So like, I don't know if that's a good example, but um, it's a, it's a question that I'm constantly trying to tackle. Like why, Right. Why stop motion? For instance, with my own stuff, like I've been pitching around some preschool shows in stop motion specifically because I want to inspire kids to do like arts and crafts in real life and to know that the thing that they're watching, they can actually like reach out, hold, touch, right. make themselves like that's a big part of what I want it to be, I guess. So there's there's almost a tactile quality to, yeah, to totally, stop motion totally. storytelling that you don't yeah, and, get with CGI. And there's tons of stop motion that isn't really popularized, like stop motion in nature. You might see like some people like move around rocks on a beach or yeah. something like that. Like you can't accomplish that type of aesthetic. I'm fascinated by stop motion because I don't do it. And it's like, I, I feel almost like I do about live action where I'm just like, you know, good luck with all that. You know what I mean? Because I I appreciate it. Uh, and and in some cases, there's some stop motion movies that are some of my favorite movies of all time. Um, and uh, it, it, but it's it's really interesting to hear you speak about it because I I think it's very similar to what I go through with 2D because I think it's the same thing. I think yeah. with 2D, it you know inherently should look like something that came from someone's hand. Right. Whether it's a painting like we, we did Headspace, which is meant to or, or we did a show called Losers for Netflix that was also uh, meant to evoke, you know, painted illustration or Teenage Euthanasia, which is meant to have like a very sketchy underground kind of comic style. Um, it should feel like somebody drew it like it was made by a human person. And I think that affects um, the relationship you have with the characters in the story and the world i think it's the world more than anything else it's like i mean i think to, to a degree it's like um well like marshall McLuhan, right the media is the message and i think that that goes for animation styles you know like for example like you know south park um you know I, i've always said that you know what what's most successful at south park is the thing that people don't talk about which is the look of it you know, the fact that it looks like, you know, construction paper cutouts of children and has such a simple, uh, uh, almost, um, uh, it's like, it's like, it's like a kid's, kid's artwork mixed with, it's got obviously a, a stop motion quality. Um, it, it was originally you know, done in stop motion. Exactly. You know, if you read the Santa Claus thing, right. It's like, it had this very, and it's all meant to, to evoke that. Yeah. Like, I, I think that it creates a world that where children that like are murdering each other and cursing and are filthy and awful um it's very palatable to yeah, watch totally. it's a very it's a very very palatable and i don't and I, I i can't imagine if you know south park uh you know looked like toy story or if it if it was live action or if it was drawn like archer you know a more realistic illustrative style, i don't think it would be as successful and yeah. that that's a great example of the media being the message itself totally, like the totally. media is a child's paper construction paper which is just somewhere in the back of all of our cerebral cortex right we're all remember construction paper and that little bit texture and early south park they had more of that texture and the and even like the the cell shadow they have and all that stuff so i think that um 2d is similar in that when it feels like somebody drew it for you it feels a little more intimate and i think that's why comedy tends to work especially adult comedy um more successfully with 2D drawings than it does CGI. Because I think personally, I've always felt like for big emotion, like, um, you know, like horror movies, I've, I'm of the theory that the bigger the budget of the horror movie, the less scary it is, right? Like low budget, like give me Night of the Living Dead, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. These cost probably like $500 a piece. And they are absolutely terrifying whereas a movie like it 
or Stranger Things, like those don't scare me because they look too expensive. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I'm not scared. Well, and there's something, there's something almost like imaginative about uh, more of the abstract, even yeah. the 2D, like when, when you're watching like, you know, Super Jail or something, because it's all very yeah. stylized and abstract. It almost lends itself to the imagination more than 3D, which when I watch 3D, you know, if it's, if it's in the screen, it's there, there's nothing right there's nothing extra going on or like right I, I, what am i trying to say like when i watch something in 3d like i watch a pixar movie my imagine does may, my imagination doesn't expand beyond what i see on the screen because everything is right. created specifically for me in a 3d i mean I, you know i am not going to be one of those 2d people that you know uh is going to criticize you know, CGI as being in any way less than. I just think things are things work to their own strengths because look, there's Pixar movies that are just absolutely uh, mind blowing and moving experiences. I just I tend to think the current state of what we think of with a CGI movie, and this could change because I'm starting to see CGI movies um, that are pushing the envelope stylistically but as far as what we envision which i think is largely dictated by pixar um yeah they tend to be yeah they tend to be spectacles right and that's a that's an outgrowth of the evolution of disney right disney always made spectacles it was like you know i went back and you know watched you know because me and and one of my uh animation directors katie uh, you know, we watch, we purposefully, we watch a new animated film every, on a weekly basis and we, we sit down and we deconstruct it together every week. And these are things from the twenties all the way up to, you know, whatever just came out. And, um, you know, if you watch the history of Disney, they were always making a spectacle film. It almost in a way was already feeling more than human. If you watch Snow White, you go like, I watch Snow White and I go, how in God's name do edit anyone draw these things in the thirties? Like it's like, even now. Or the 40, even now you couldn't do something like this. So then, and then you see, you know, something like soul, you know, which equally is, and it, it's an experience, it's an otherworldly experience and it feels big and it feels like a spectacle and it's closer to, you know, filmmakers like, like David Lean or, you know, Kubrick that made these like giant, in- incredible films or Spielberg that make these like incredibly large, impressive experiences, right? That's very different than the experience of watching a Bakshi film or watching, you know, a, a Adult Swim or Super Jail or, or things like that, that feel a little bit more intimate and handmade, like I'm having a direct experience. You know, it's like, you know, I, I think what, you know, 2D animated movies and, you know, at least the indie ones feel closer to things like, you know, Jim Jarmusch, you know, or Werner Herzog or like indie filmmakers, uh, you know, than they do, you know, big budget like you know films if that makes sense totally and like um you can't really do independent giant films and cg because it would take your whole life like you got to do it's <laughs> modeling uh, look and- i've been working on you know you're asking what we're working on you know one of the things that we're always working on is our feature film called the adventures of drunky which is you know we've been working on that for over four years now because like you just said it's not cg but it's a feature film it's a feature indie indie film and it takes time it is hard to make it is so hard to make something well and i think part of the thing with cg is you can't i mean you can go back and watch cg from 10 years ago like toy story whatnot but it doesn't it doesn't have the same impressive qualities like you feel like you've moved on like you know it's hard to watch you can't like show a kid these days that and expect them to be blown away right but 2d it's it's kind of timeless, like you just said. You can watch Snow White now and still be blown away because it's- yeah, I, I I think we've had more distance though. I will say because it's true. Even if you go like I was watching like even like Cars, like the first Cars or like The Incredibles. It's like watch The Incredibles and then watch The Incredibles two, and even yeah. just between the chasm of quality between those two. Even though I think the first Incredibles is a is a better movie, it's it, it's incredible. It, it, it's amazing how quickly the technology evolves. But that being said we're too close to it you know what i mean because you know i i, I met um i'm obsessed with fleischer fleischer's like my favorite animated films ever made and um when i that took place in new york they made fleischer you know the betty boop and popeye was all made here in new york city so when i was in college a couple of my teachers either you know were on the periphery of that era 
mm -hmm. know what I mean? Whether or at least knew some of the people that worked for Fleischer, you know, in the forties. Um, and they said that, you know, they were always confused why I like, they're like, what do you like this stuff for? It's like, it's oh, like no. dated. you know what I mean? And they said that, um, I remember Howard Beckerman was one of my teachers and he's, he's kind of a luminary here in New York, as far as, you know, animation history. And, um, he told me that the people that he met in the sixties that had worked at Fleischer in the forties would hide that they worked, they didn't even put it on their resume that they worked oh, wow. for Fleischer what? because at the time, it was the 60s, right? It was like Yellow Submarine. Like that's what yeah, was yeah, exciting, yeah. right? Uh, 101 Dalmatians was all this kind of like weird edgy stuff. And then so oh like this, goodness. this car, think about, think about the difference between Yellow Submarine yeah. and Betty Boop. Like Betty Boop seemed corny. He used the word corny. He said, oh, they all said like this stuff was too corny. Like the gags were kind of corny and silly. Like everybody was on acid and smoking weed, Bakshi, like all this stuff was coming in that was like all this counterculture stuff. So these cartoony, you know, people, you know, animals bouncing around on the street, you know, and, and having a light bulb pop out of that seemed really corny to them. So they would hide the fact that they even worked there. I right to so get a job animator <laughs> yeah they're probably the incredibly master <laughs> animators you know i remember hearing stories that tex avery at the end of his life uh couldn't even get hired uh because people felt like it was he was too dated so my point is only that like you know give things enough time like Fair i'll enough, bet you people yeah. will at some point will look at early cgi with the same way we look at like early you know, Fleischer of iWorks, because it's like the older it gets, it actually gets kind of interesting because it sort of, ha totally, you, you have totally. And when you saturate it. all styles, like right now, 2D animation is like literally every style. Like we have Cuphead, which, you know, right. brought back Fleischer style, yeah, rubber yeah. hose, whatever. So maybe you're right. I, I never actually right. thought about CG like that. Like maybe we'll reach a, an age where CG is just so cheap and every, every studio is doing it that they actually bring back this kind of like old looking primitive yeah Indeed for sure it's, it's 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 exciting it's exciting you know it's like filmmakers you know it's like uh, i don't know uh spielberg making schindler's list in black and white you know what i mean uh, it's he obviously wasn't doing that because it was the latest technology yeah. it just it it probably gave the film a, a you know a, a tone that brought you back to that era in a way that this brightly saturated modern looking film wouldn't bring so you know again the media is the message and i think that you know, you're going to see a lot of that and you're start, and, and I'm seeing it a lot more in, in experimental films um, and, and definitely a lot of films coming out of Asia where they're taking CGI and they're treating it in different ways. I, honestly, even the new SpongeBob movie was interesting. The way they treated that, the, yeah. way, the, way, the way they treated the CGI in that in a much more cartoony approach than you see in like the, you know, the, the you know, in your Pixar and your- I oh, totally Jim loved it. They, like they took a very like stop motion slash 2D- It did. They did a lot original, of low frame yeah, rate. And that's, that's, that's really, that's it really made it, interesting. It made it super like just fun to just watch. I didn't, like, you don't even need to listen. I'm just, I'm just there for the smear yeah. and whatnot. Um, so, well, uh, I'd love to chat all day, but you know, this is maybe a good point to end off on. Is there anything else yeah. that you wanted to share as we're kind of wrapping up our chat? uh it's it's i could i could talk about this kind of stuff forever and so we'll i have 10 I, more 10 more episodes yeah no well i i appreciate you having a podcast like that this where we can you know animators can can talk about animation because it's it's an art i think it personally you know i've always said and and i say this with no irony that it's one of the greatest uh greatest art forms uh, oh, in, totally, in human yeah. history. I, I think it, it it works on on levels that that few other art forms do. I mean, the fact that we can do something visual that works with movement and sound uh, and personality and music, and it combines all these amazing things into to a really transcendent experience when it really works um, is something really special. So the fact that you have a podcast where people are just talking about that uh, is, 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 is really, really exciting. So I appreciate you doing well, that. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking yeah. about this with me. It's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I, I'll just say, uh, just to, to promote uh, Teenage Euthanasia on Adult Swim, please check it out. Uh, it's, it's Sunday nights at midnight. Uh, and uh, definitely, you know, follow, uh, you know, at Teenage Euthanasia on Instagram, uh, as well as our studio, Augen Book Studios on Instagram. Uh, and if you want to see all the animations we've done in the past two decades, and in addition, you can contact us 
if you're looking for for jobs or if you're just interested in animation the animation we do uh the best place to go is augenblickstudios.com uh you can go through go see everything there so teenage youth in asia is on adult swim and also please check out swan boy on uh fx is a part of the show cake which talk about you know uh you know animation and experimental animation we have one of the major networks fox uh fx is is has a half hour of just experimental animation and i think that's pretty incredible and i didn't even pay you but you took the words right out of my mouth you took my whole ending spiel so oh no i'm sorry <laughs> I'm uh did all that I, this yeah, is yeah, great I, I uh, that's all for cool. now <laughs> thank you so much uh, for yes. listening I love to talk about animation and clearly I, I love to promote too. So, uh, right, well, Terry, this was awesome. Yes. And if you're listening, I will include all those links in the description of the chat. So thank you so much for checking this out. And that's all for now. Great. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. The music for this podcast was composed by Will Farmer and the graphics by Daniel Abensauer. I encourage you to look them up if you enjoyed their work.